In this section, we will discuss the conversational logic behind why certain implicatures arise in discourse. Let's start with the following example in one. Did Raj feed the cat and clean the litter box? He fed the cat. Aya infers he didn't clean the litter box. Terminologically, the speaker signer creates an implicature or they imply that contact. The addressee makes an inference or they infer that contact. Terminological note. We use speaker or signer and addressee in this chapter to discuss the dichotomy of producer of utterance versus person at whom the utterance was directed. Where we are referring to the producer of an utterance in a spoken language in particular, we will use speaker. Where we are referring to the producer of an utterance in a signed language in particular, we will use signer. When we are referring to producer of utterance in a more general way, not specific to modality, we will use speaker or signer. Outside of this textbook, you may encounter speaker being used to mean producer of utterance, not specific to modality. Some sign language users do not have a problem with this use of speaker, but many sign language users think a more modality inclusive term should be used. Some other alternatives for this include utterer, addressee, addresser, addressee, author, addressee, sender, perceiver, producer, perceiver, sender, receiver, sender, recipient, and communicator, audience. The basic idea of why we get this implicature in this context is that if Raj had fed the cat and cleaned the litter box, Bo would have said so. He didn't in this case, so Aya can infer that only Raj fed the cat is true and that Raj cleaned the litter box is false. Here is how this implicature would be calculated by Aya. I asked Bo if Raj fed the cat and cleaned the litter box. I assume that Bo would only tell me things that are true. I assume that Bo would give me the maximally informative answer to my question. Bo could have answered, Raj fed the cat and cleaned the litter box, Raj fed the cat, Raj cleaned the litter box, or Raj didn't feed the cat or clean the litter box. If the actual facts were that Raj fed the cat and cleaned the litter box, then the following answers would be logically true statements. Raj fed the cat and cleaned the litter box, Raj fed the cat and Raj cleaned the litter box. However, if Raj actually fed the cat and cleaned the litter box, Raj fed the cat and cleaned the litter box would be the more informative thing to say than Raj fed the cat or Raj cleaned the litter box. In actuality, Bo only said Raj fed the cat. This must be because if he said Raj fed the cat and cleaned the litter box, it would be a false statement. Therefore, it must be the case that only Raj fed the cat is true and that Raj cleaned the litter box is false. This way of analyzing how implicatures arise in discourse is called the cooperative principle, proposed by philosopher Paul Grice. He proposed that one way of explaining how we get implicatures in a conversation is to think that there are implicit conversational principles that discourse participants follow. According to the cooperative principle, the major underlying assumption that we make in a conversation is that all discourse participants are acting in a way to accomplish conversational goals. For example, let's say that the topic of discussion was how much money should we spend on our cat's birthday party? If everyone in the conversation agrees that the goal is to figure out a reasonable cost for the party, then all discourse participants assume that everyone in the conversation is acting in a reasonable way and uttering things in order to accomplish this goal. This is what's meant by cooperation in the cooperative principle. Specifically, Grice described four maxims or general rules of conduct that might be the basis of many conversations. The maxim of quality, the maxim of quantity, maxim of relation, and the maxim of manner. The idea is that if these are the conversational rules that people follow, and if people assume that other people follow these rules too, then there is an explanation of why certain implicatures arise in discourse. You will notice that the maxims are stated as imperatives. For example, do this, don't do that. These are not meant to be prescriptive do's and don'ts. They should be taken as a way to describe someone's pragmatic knowledge in a language. It's similar to how phonological rules can be stated like, 
turn voiceless consonants into voiced consonants, or don't voice the consonant if you already have a voiced obstruent in the morpheme. Grice at one point describes the cooperative principle as something that is reasonable for us to follow and something that we should not abandon. Sometimes this is misinterpreted to mean that the cooperative principle is a set of prescriptive rules, something along the lines of, if you don't follow these rules, you are not a good language user. However, that is not what he meant. A better interpretation of the cooperative principle goes something like this. If discourse participants have a common immediate goal in the conversation, then it is in their best interest to follow something like the cooperative principle. Grice pondered that this type of assumption may be an extension of cooperative transactions in general, not limited to language. For example, if you and I agree to get a car fixed together, it would be in our best interest to act in a cooperative way to accomplish this goal. Of course, what counts as cooperative in a conversation might be different depending on what kind of conversation it is. What if you're fighting, or writing a letter, or making a witness statement in court? For the sake of exemplifying how the cooperative principle works, our examples in this chapter will be ordinary conversations, for example, casual conversations between friends, families, and roommates. But after you are done reading or listening to this chapter, you are encouraged to think further about how the cooperative principle might work differently in other types of discourse. Speaking of variation, we have seen already that conversational rules can vary from community to community, meaning that what counts as cooperative might vary depending on who the interlocutors are, not just the discourse genre. We will study the cooperative principle as applied to various linguistic communities, and you are also encouraged to think about how conversational rules might differ in your own cultures. The linguist way of thinking about the cooperative principle is that it is subject to variation within and across language communities. Keeping all this in mind, let's take a look at the four maxims that Grice described.